Alfred the Great was King of Wessex from 871 to 899. Alfred successfully defended his kingdom against the Viking attempt at conquest, and by the time of his death had become the dominant ruler in England. He is one of only two English monarchs to be given the epithet the Great, the other being the Scandinavian Cnut the Great. He was also the first king of the West Saxons to style himself King of the Anglo-Saxons. Details of Alfred's life are described in a work by the 10th century Welsh scholar and bishop Asser, a devout Christian. Alfred had a reputation as a learned and merciful man of a gracious and level-headed nature who encouraged education and improved his kingdom's legal system, military structure and his people's quality of life. Childhood Alfred was born in the village of Wanating, now Wantage, Oxfordshire. He was the youngest son of King Ethel Wolfe of Wessex by his first wife, Osber. In 853, at the age of four, Alfred is said to have been sent to Rome where, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, he was confirmed by Pope Leo IV who anointed him as king. Victorian writers later interpreted this as an anticipatory coronation in preparation for his ultimate succession to the throne of Wessex. However, his succession could not have been foreseen at the time, as Alfred had three living elder brothers. A letter of Leo IV shows that Alfred was made of consul, a misinterpretation of this investiture, deliberate or accidental could explain later confusion. It may also be based on Alfred's later having accompanied his father on a pilgrimage to Rome where he spent some time at the court of Charles the Bald, King of the Franks, around 854 to 855. On their return from Rome in 856, Ethel Wolf was deposed by his son Ethel Bald. With civil war looming, the magnates of the realm met in council to hammer out a compromise. Ethelbald would retain the western shires, and Ethel Wolf would rule in the east. When King Ethel Wolf died in 858, Wessex was ruled by three of Alfred's brothers in succession, Ethelbald, Ethelbet and Ethelred. Bishop Passer tells the story of how as a child Alfred won a prize of a volume of poetry in Saxon, offered by his mother to the first of her children able to memorize it. Legend also has it that the young Alfred spent time in Ireland seeking healing. Alfred was troubled by health problems throughout his life. It is thought that he may have suffered from Crohn's disease. Statues of Alfred in Winchester and Wantage portray him as a great warrior. Evidence suggests he was not physically strong, and though not lacking in courage, he was noted more for his intellect than a warlike character. Reigns of Alfred's Brothers During the short reigns of the older two of his three elder brothers, Ethelbald of Wessex and Ethelbet of Wessex, Alfred is not mentioned. An army of Danes which the Anglo-Saxon chronicle described as the Great Heathen Army had landed in East Anglia with the intent of conquering the four kingdoms that constituted Anglo-Saxon England in 865. It was with the backdrop of a rampaging Viking army that Alfred's public life began, with the accession of his third brother, Ethelred of Wessex. In 865, it is during this period that Bishop Passer applied to Alfred the unique title of Secundarius, which may indicate his position akin to that of the Celtic Tanist, a recognized successor closely associated with the reigning monarch. It is possible that this arrangement was sanctioned by Alfred's father, or by the Witten, to guard against the danger of a disputed succession should Ethelred fall in battle. The arrangement of crowning a successor as royal prince and military commander is well known among other Germanic tribes, such as the Swedes and Franks, to whom the Anglo-Saxons were closely related, fighting the Viking invasion in 868. Alfred is recorded as fighting beside Ethelred in an unsuccessful attempt to keep the great heathen army led by Eva the Boneless out of the adjoining kingdom of Mercia. At the end of 870, the Danes arrived in his homeland. The year which followed has been called Alfred's Year of Battles.
Nine engagements were fought with varying outcomes, though the place and date of two of these battles have not been recorded. In Berkshire, a successful skirmish at the Battle of Englefield on 31 December 870 was followed by a severe defeat of the siege and Battle of Reading by Evers. Brother Halfdan Ragnarsson on 5 January 871. Four days later, the Anglo-Saxons won a brilliant victory at the Battle of Ashdown on the Berkshire Downs, possibly near Compton or Aldworth. Alfred is particularly credited with the success of this latter battle. Later that month, on the 22nd of January, the Saxons were defeated at the Battle of Basing. They were defeated again on the 22nd of March at the Battle of Merton. Ethelred died shortly afterwards on the 23rd of April. King at War. Early struggles, defeat and flight in April 871. King Ethelred died, and Alfred succeeded to the throne of Wessex and the burden of its defence. Despite the fact that Ethelred left two underage sons, Ethelhelm and Ethel were old. This was in accordance with the agreement that Ethelred and Alfred had made earlier that year in an assembly at Swimburg. The brothers had agreed that whichever of them outlived the other would inherit the personal property that King Ethel Wolf had left jointly to his sons in his will. The deceased sons would receive only whatever property and riches their father had settled upon him and whatever additional lands their uncle had acquired. The unstated premise was that the surviving brother would be king. Given the ongoing Danish invasion and the youth of his nephews, Alfred's accession probably went uncontested. While he was busy with the burial ceremonies for his brother, the Danes defeated the Saxon army in his absence at an unnamed spot, and then again in his presence at Wilton in May. The defeat at Wilton smashed any remaining hope that Alfred could drive the invaders from his kingdom. He was forced instead to make peace with them, according to sources that do not tell what the terms of the peace were. Bishop Passa claimed that the pagans agreed to vacate the realm and made good their promise. Indeed, the Viking army did withdraw from Reading in the autumn of 871 to take up winter quarters in Mercy in London. Although not mentioned by Assa or by the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Alfred probably also paid the Vikings cash to leave, much as the Mercians were to do in the following year. Hordes dating to the Viking occupation of London in 871 halves have been excavated at Croydon, Gravesend, and Waterloo Bridge. These finds hint at the cost involved in making peace with the Vikings. For the next five years, the Danes occupied other parts of England. In 876 under their new leader, Guthrum, the Danes slipped past the Saxon army and attacked and occupied Wareham in Dorset. Alfred blockaded him but was unable to take Wareham by assault. Accordingly, he negotiated a peace which involved an exchange of hostages and oaths, which the Danes swore on their holy ring associated with the worship of Thor. The Danes, however, broke their word and, after killing all the hostages, slipped away under cover of night to Exeter in Devon. Alfred blockaded the Viking ships in Devon, and with a relief fleet having been scattered by a storm, the Danes were forced to submit. The Danes withdrew to Mercia. In January 878, the Danes made a sudden attack on Chippenham, a royal stronghold in which Alfred had been staying over Christmas and most of the people they killed, except the King Alfred, and he with the little band made his way by wood and swamp, and after Easter he made a fort at Athelney in the marshes of Somerset, and from that fort kept fighting against the foe. From his fort at Athelney, an island in the marshes near North Pedderton, Alfred was able to mount an effective resistance movement, rallying the local militias from Somerset, Wiltshire and Hampshire. A popular legend, originating from 12th century chronicles, tells how when he first fled to the Somerset levels, Alfred was given shelter by a peasant woman who, unaware of his identity, left him to watch some cakes she had left cooking on the fire. Preoccupied with the problems of his kingdom, Alfred accidentally let the cakes burn, and was roundly scolded by the woman upon her return. 878 was the low-water mark in the history of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. 
with all the other kingdoms having fallen to the Vikings, Wessex alone was still resisting counter-attack and victory in the seventh week after Easter, around Whitsuntide, Alfred rode to Egbert's Stone, east of Selwood, where he was met by all the people of Somerset and of Wiltshire and of that part of Hampshire which is on this side of the sea, and they rejoiced to see him. Alfred's emergence from his marshland stronghold was part of a carefully planned offensive that entailed raising the feards of three shires. This meant not only that the king had retained the loyalty of Eildor men, royal reeves and king's thens, but that they had maintained their positions of authority in these localities well enough to answer his summons to war. Alfred's actions also suggest a system of scouts and messengers. Alfred won a decisive victory in the ensuing Battle of Eddington which may have been fought near Westbury, Wiltshire. He then pursued the Danes to their stronghold at Chippenham and starved them into submission. One of the terms of the surrender was that Guthrum convert to Christianity. Three weeks later the Danish king and 29 of his chief men were baptized at Alfred's court at Allais, near Athelney, with Alfred receiving Guthrum as his spiritual son. The unbinding of the chrism took place with great ceremony eight days later at the royal estate at Wedmore in Somerset after which Guthrum fulfilled his promise to leave Wessex. There is no contemporary evidence that Alfred and Guthrum agreed upon a formal treaty at this time. The so-called Treaty of Wedmore is an invention of modern historians. The Treaty of Alfred and Guthrum, preserved in Old English in Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, and in a latent compilation known as Quadripartitis, was negotiated later, perhaps in 879 or 880, when King Seol Wolf II of Mercia was deposed. That treaty divided up the Kingdom of Mercia. By its terms the boundary between Alfred's and Guthrum's kingdoms was to run up the River Thames, to the River Lee, follow the Lee to its source, from there extend in a straight line to Bedford, and from Bedford follow the River Eus to Watling. Street. In other words, Alfred succeeded to see Old Wolf's kingdom, consisting of Western Mercia, and Guthrum incorporated the eastern part of Mercia into an enlarged kingdom of East Anglia, by terms of the treaty. Moreover, Alfred was to have control over the Mercian city of London and its mints, at least for the time being. The disposition of Essex, held by West Saxon kings since the days of Egbert, is unclear from the treaty, though, given Alfred's political and military superiority, it would have been surprising if he had conceded any disputed territory to his new godson. Quiet Years, Restoration of London with the signing of the Treaty of Alfred and Guthrum, an event most commonly held to have taken place around 880 when Guthrum's people began settling East Anglia, Guthrum was neutralised as a threat. In conjunction with this agreement a Danish army left the island and sailed to Ghent. Alfred was still forced to contend with a number of Danish threats. A year later in 881 Alfred fought a small sea battle against four Danish ships on the high seas. Two of the ships were destroyed and the others surrendered to Alfred's forces. Similar small skirmishes with independent Viking raiders would have occurred for much of the period as they had for decades. In the year 883, though there is some debate over the year, King Alfred, because of his support and his donation of arms to Rome, received a number of gifts from the Pope Marinus. Among these gifts was reputed to be a piece of the true cross, a true treasure for the devout Saxon king. According to Asser, because of Pope Marinus of friendship with King Alfred, the Pope granted an exemption to any Anglo-Saxons residing within Rome from tax or tribute. After the signing of the treaty with Guthrum, Alfred was spared any large-scale conflicts for some time. Despite this relative peace, the king was still forced to deal with a number of Danish raids and incursions. Among these was a raid taking place in Kent, an allied country in southeast England, during the year 885, which was quite possibly the largest raid since the battles with Guthrum. At his account of the raid places the Danish raiders at the Saxon city of Rochester, where they built a temporary fortress in order to besiege the city. 
In response to this incursion, Alfred led an Anglo-Saxon force against the Danes who, instead of engaging the army of Wessex, fled to their beach ships and sailed to another part of Britain. The retreating Danish force supposedly left Britain the following summer. Not long after the failed Danish raid in Kent, Alfred dispatched his fleet to East Anglia. The purpose of this expedition is debated, though Asa claims that it was for the sake of plunder. After travelling up the river Stour, the fleet was met by Danish vessels that numbered 13 or 16 and a battle ensued. The Anglo-Saxon fleet emerged victorious and as Huntington accounts, laden with spoils. The victorious fleet was then caught unawares when attempting to leave the river Stour and was attacked by a Danish force at the mouth of the river. The Danish fleet was able to defeat Alfred's fleet which may have been weakened in the previous engagement. A year later, in 886, Alfred reoccupied the city of London and set out to make it habitable again. Alfred entrusted the city to the care of his son-in-law Ethelred, Ealdorman of Mercia. The restoration of London progressed through the latter half of the 880s and is believed to have revolved around a new street plan, added fortifications in addition to the existing Roman walls, and, some believe, the construction of matching fortifications on the south bank of the River Thames. This is also the period in which almost all chroniclers agree that the Saxon people of pre-unification England submitted to Alfred. This was not, however, the point at which Alfred came to be known as King of England. In fact he would never adopt the title for himself. In truth the power which Alfred wielded over the English peoples at this time seemed to stem largely from the military might of the West Saxons. Alfred's political connections from having the ruler of Mercia as his son-in-law, and Alfred's keen administrative talents, between the restoration of London and the resumption of large-scale Danish attacks in the early 890s, Alfred's reign was rather uneventful. The relative peace of the late 880s was marred by the death of Alfred's sister, Ethelswith, who died en route to Rome in 888. In the same year the Archbishop of Canterbury, Ethelred, also died. One year later Guthrum, or Athelstan by his baptismal name, Alfred's former enemy and king of East Anglia, died and was buried in Hadley, Suffolk. Guthrum's passing changed the political landscape for Alfred. The resulting power vacuum stirred up other power-hungry warlords eager to take his place in the following years. The quiet years of Alfred's life were coming to a close, and war was on the horizon. Further Viking attacks repelled after another lull. In the autumn of 892 or 893, the Danes attacked again. Finding their position in mainland Europe precarious, they crossed to England in 330 ships in two divisions. They entrenched themselves, the larger body at Appledore, Kent, and the lesser, under Haystein, at Milton, also in Kent. The invaders brought their wives and children with them, indicating a meaningful attempt at conquest and colonization. Alfred, in 893 or 894, took up a position from which he could observe both forces. While he was in talks with Haystein, the Danes at Appledore broke out and struck northwestwards. They were overtaken by Alfred's eldest son, Edward, and were defeated in a general engagement at Farnham in Surrey. They took refuge on an island at Thorny, on Hertfordshire's River Colne, where they were blockaded and were ultimately forced to submit. The force fell back on Essex and, after suffering another defeat at Benfleet, coalesced with Haystein's force at Shubury. Alfred had been on his way to relieve his son at Thorny when he heard that the Northumbrian and East Anglian Danes were besieging Exeter and an unnamed stronghold on the North Devon shore. Alfred at once hurried westward and raised the siege of Exeter. The fate of the other place is not recorded. Meanwhile, the force under Haystein set out to march up the Thames Valley, possibly with the idea of assisting their friends in the west. They were met by a large force under the three great Eildal men of Mercia, Wiltshire and Somerset, and forced to head off to the northwest. 
being finally overtaken and blockaded at Buttington. An attempt to break through the English lines was defeated. Those who escaped retreated to Shoebury. After collecting reinforcements, they made a sudden dash across England and occupied the ruined Roman walls of Chester. The English did not attempt a winter blockade, but contented themselves with destroying all the supplies in the district. Early in 894 or 895, lack of food obliged the Danes to retire once more to Essex. At the end of the year, the Danes drew their ships up the River Thames and River Lee and fortified themselves 20 miles north of London. A direct attack on the Danish lines failed but, later in the year, Alfred saw a means of obstructing the river so as to prevent the egress of the Danish ships. The Danes realized that they were outmaneuvered. They struck off northwestwards and wintered at Courtbridge near Bridge North. The next year, 896, they gave up the struggle. Some retired to Northumbria, some to East Anglia. Those who had no connections in England withdrew back to the continent.